Join spiritual feminist and empowerment coach Joni Advent Maher for Trust Your Sacred Feminine Flow. Listen in for intimate conversations about money, transformation, and feminine sovereignty. And now, your host, Joni Advent Maher. Welcome to Trust Your Sacred Feminine Flow. I'm your host, Joni Advent Maher spiritual midwife, mystic, and a transformational guide. Today's episode is a special and unique journey I want to share with you. I'm having a conversation with my 14-year-old daughter, Lila, and this just this week we were honoring and celebrating an anniversary passage for her. It's been a year since She and we as a family were facing her suicidal depression, her self-harm, and her eating disorder. So it's a really big deal for us this week. And I wanted to share our conversation because as is so often the case, our children are powerful teachers in our lives and conduits for generational growth and healing, their own growth and healing, and our growth and healing as their parents. And so often we only talk about the shining, happy moments and we don't really go into those deeper moments of adversity, pain, or challenge where the real growth and transformation occurs in our lives. So here's Lila and I. Welcome, Lila. Oh, hi. (laughs) Hi, I'm Lila. (laughs) Thanks for taking the time to be with me today. I know you have other places you might rather be right now, but I appreciate you being here. Yeah, sure. (laughs) (laughs) So I invited you on because we have just completed a pretty big passage, actually, as of yesterday, and it felt like it could be a useful thing to have a conversation about and, frankly, to share about because I think there may be many people facing this in their lives, and it's not always talked about a great deal. So do you want to say anything about what we were honoring yesterday? I mean, I don't know how to, like, say it, I guess. I don't know. Okay. How would you say it? Would it be helpful if I shared? I guess. if, If I said it, so... Well, I think it's fair to say that you went through a pretty rough passage for a couple of years. Yeah. Um, we, you had a pretty big loss in your life with your grandmother, and then you had some pretty serious issues with friends and, or I don't even know, do we call them friends? What do we call it? With peers and there was some depression, and things kind of came to a head last year, and you started experiencing impulses to self-harm, and there was uh, some suicidal Or it wasn't last year, it was 2017. 2017, okay. Um, Anyway, we went through a passage of very intensely, like six months, that yesterday was the anniversary of no more self-harm for one year. Is that correct? Is that how you would say it? Yeah. Yes. So that was a pretty big deal for all of us. You, your dad, and me. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. Yes. So when you think about yesterday and and what that means to you to have celebrated a year without harming yourself after a period of pretty intense and regular self-harm what does that what does it mean to you what do you think about that what goes through your mind i mean i don't know for a while it was kind of hard for me to be proud of that because I don't know 
some part of me just felt like I put you guys through too much, I guess, and that I shouldn't. Mm. But um, now I'm I'm just happy to be out of it, I guess. Mm. Yeah. So it was hard to just claim being proud. Yeah, I guess that, so. Yes. Right. So it sounds like you were blaming yourself some for what had happened. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And does that still feel like the case? A little bit, but not really anymore. I know that I was very sick. Yes. You were having some pretty intense depression going on. Yeah, it's digressed now. It's, did you say digressed? Decreased. Decreased, yes. Yeah. And part of why I felt like it would be useful to have this conversation is because, frankly, there are so many people who... I know you and I have talked about this, like that you're dealt a hand that you might not have chosen. Yeah. Um, And it's not a great hand, but it's a hand you played and you're like making the best of it. You're making the most of it. But just like you said, it seems like a lot of times people feel ashamed when things get messy or when things, for lack of a better word, maybe get a little out of control for a while. Does that feel yeah. true? Yeah, that is, that's definitely true. Yeah. And the thing is, is that, cause you know, personally, I've had my own times, uh, in my, you know, in my past where things got out of control and pretty messy. And I'm someone who's been in recovery for alcoholism and addiction for over 30 years at this point. But, you know, there was a point in my life where things looked pretty bad. Yeah. So I guess one of the things, well, I don't guess, I know that one of the things that I have learned in my years in recovery and just in my years of working with other people is, is that we are not to blame for the hand we were dealt, the genetics that we've, you know, that we've received or the uh, relationships that, we are living in uh, to the extent of family and whatnot. We're not to blame for that. We do have the responsibility to see how we want to respond once we have the tools and things like that. But, but you have, you have done an incredible job, Lila, just taking this on and really making the most of healing. And And, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. Just, I know that there are going to be hard days. Like there still are some days where I just feel really bad, but it's just, I guess, easier to get through them having experienced some good stuff. Yes. And I know you've also been able to support peers who have struggled with this as well. Yeah, I have. And when you see them going through rough times or things getting messy, does it feel any easier to be kinder to yourself about it or? I don't, it doesn't really affect me. It doesn't. That way, I guess. It doesn't. Okay. Well, I know that, uh, well, I don't know. I guess it might be hard was was it hard to have to, for example, come back to school or be in a, a setting with peers where there's so much intensity around looking a certain way or acting a certain way or coming across? I mean, there isn't really that much pressure at my school, but I mean, just returning to normal life after being in such a regulated environment was pretty difficult, I guess. So, I mean, can you say more about that? 
I mean, when you're back in a place where people haven't seen you and you disappeared for like a long period of time, people are going to ask questions. Right. And how did you handle that? I just, I don't really care anymore. Like people still ask me questions. I'll usually tell them straight up. I'm like, I was dealing with stuff unless I don't know them. And then I'll be like, go away. (laughs) But I, I don't know. I just, I don't really care anymore. Yeah. So you have been pretty straightforward and honest about this and willing, like willing to share for the most part. And I I know I had said to you that as we were going through this experience together, I really didn't feel like outside of my small intimate circle of uh, women who support me through thick and thin, I didn't really feel like it was my right to talk about this uh, because it was your story. Um, So it feels important to me just to be able to have your permission and for us to to do this, to be able to speak openly about what it was like, because you're right, it was challenging for all of us. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's kind of like, yeah, I tried to kill myself and that happened. That that doesn't really affect me anymore. Like it, the people take it way too, people treat it like it's really taboo, but it's, it's really not. It's just, it's just not something to be ashamed of, Mm. in my opinion. I don't feel like I should have to like lie to people. Good. And so from that standpoint, it's okay for dad and I, for example, to to be open and honest about what you went through. Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> Without telling your story. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I think sometimes, particularly as moms and dads, um, just like you were in a place of perhaps blaming yourself we of course went through our own version of that of feeling responsible and blaming ourselves Um, and that being said it it felt like the experience really gave us an opportunity to grow and to change and to face some things that we needed to address and clean up Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I feel like going through a process like that, honestly, it can kind of, I don't know how to exactly say this, but it can kind of make you a more developed person than someone that hasn't had to go through recovery or anything like that because there's so much self-exploration that you have to do in that process. Yes. And, And if you hadn't had to face that adversity, you might be too busy just doing whatever. <laughs> I guess, yeah, yeah. T- to bother with the self-exploration. I mean, I'd be a completely different person for sure. Yes. If I hadn't gone through that. And honestly, like, it was hard, yeah. But I'm happy I went through it. Really? Yeah, yeah. Because I am who I am. I'm pretty happy with who I am right now. I'm living a pretty good life. Hmm. not saying that it was fun but it was it was I guess something good came out of it Hmm. well that is music to my ears and and I I would agree with you frankly I feel like we as a family are in a stronger place and a happier place and you know, there were some pretty rough times we were living through in the middle of your depression and, and you know, kind of leading up to when the self-harm and the suicidal behaviors started, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't always easy. And being an only kid, being an only child, I'm sure 
makes it that much more challenging. Yep, it does. When there's stress in the household. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess I do want to name for myself remembering that a year ago yesterday we were in the ER um, and that really, you know, felt like the darkest of the darkest days. Yeah. Um, and I was in pretty much partial solitary, I guess. Right. Yes. And I was, I was so fortunate or we were so fortunate to have a close friend of mine who came and just was there to be with, to be with us and to help uh, keep me calm and to support me. But one of the things that went through my mind when I was in, in that state, in that space with you was there's a teacher. Uh, actually, she's not a teacher. She's a writer. Javi Brooks is her name. And she has, um, a process called self-fluency she works with. But anyway, she writes a lot and writes about her journey, which isn't always easy. And, and one of the things she had written about was like when we're facing into something that's really messy or hard, like maybe this is the biggest miracle or the biggest gift that I have. I just can't see it yet. And when things were so feeling so bad that night in the ER, that's, that's what I was saying to myself. Like, that's what I was saying to myself. And that's what I was kind of putting it out to the universe. Like, let this be the, let this be the biggest gift. And actually, it, it really kind of turned out to be the beginning of the end of things being so messy so it, it was a gift well yeah I mean the hospital did that to me too I mean I told you what happened when you were out getting food I went to the bathroom and then when I came out there was yeah. an uh there was like an old dude that was like because when you're on bed search which is where I, which is where you go when you're about to get um hospitalized and they're looking for a bed for you. You're on a floor with the, you're with pediatrics, but then you're also with adults. So it's mixed. And there was this old man that was yelling at the staff and like threatening them and stuff. And I, I watched him get like chemically restrained or people yeah. in mental hospitals, in mental hospitals slang for it is booty juiced. <laughs> I, I, I watched that and um, I was just kind of like, I never, I never want to be here again. Mm. and that just kind of it kind of made me realize that I needed to change or else things weren't going to work out how I wanted them to I guess mm. so it was or, I mean there was no chance for like if I kept going after that then there would be I would be at a point of no return I guess mm. so it was a big fat wake-up call yes yeah yeah and so how does that change just how you move through your life now in terms of what you want to create or what you want to do or, you know, what your priorities are. I don't really know. <laughs> okay. It's not something you're thinking about regularly. No. <laughs> you just keep moving towards what, what feels good or what you want. Is that how it mm -hmm. works? Yeah. Good, good. And what would you, There, my guess is there are going to be moms or grandmoms or aunts listening to this conversation who may have a, a child or grandchild or someone in their life that they care about that's either going through exactly what you went through or something kind of like it. What? what would you say to them is, is helpful, legitimately helpful? Be there for them, but also don't be fully there for them and don't hold their hand through the whole thing. Like you want to help them, but you don't want to baby them through the whole experience because nothing's going to come from that. Like nothing. 
like I'm not saying like don't talk to them but help help them but be hard on them too don't be lenient so like give them firm limits or boundaries or consequences is that what you mean no 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 <laughs> I mean like no I mean don't hold their hand the whole way and don't tell them exactly how to do it they need to realize it for themselves because if they're not if they're not if they don't actually see what's wrong and you're just telling them exactly what to do, then there's absolutely no point in doing anything because if they don't see what's wrong, then nothing's going to happen. Like in the beginning, you're going to need to help them. You're going to need to like put them in treatment or something, but you can't just do everything for them. They need to realize some of it for themselves because I needed to, I had no idea what was happening. Hmm. So I know like when you tell the story about me going to get food and you witnessing that, it just like part of me feels crushed and thinks, oh God, why did I have to go get food right then? But you're saying in a way it was good. It was good. Yeah. (laughs) Because who knows if it wasn't for that old man yelling at the random people, maybe I'd be back there right now who knows Mm. I mean it's it's different for every person but that one that moment did help me I mean it wasn't like oh wow I'm cured but it helped me like I'm not trying to say like oh yeah put your child in a traumatizing situation and bingo bango bongo you're officially cured but like (laughs) that's when you were able to start walking out of the woods so to speak it yeah. sounds like. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And I will say that as your mom, there were at least a couple of times, probably way more, when I really did have to practice letting go. Let, yeah. Meaning letting go and letting you have the right to your own experience. And I, I know we, we did the first round uh, back in the fall of 2017 when you tried to kill yourself. And I realized that since before you were even born that I thought it was my responsibility to keep you alive. And I was holding on really tightly because, or my, the pregnancy before you was a miscarriage and I started bleeding with you. I thought I had to keep you alive. I didn't consciously think that, but unconsciously I was doing that. And then with all of your challenges with allergies early in your life, and I realized I had to let you go, that I I didn't know if you were going to choose to live or not live. But, But it wasn't my choice. It was your choice. And that was probably the hardest thing maybe I've ever had to do. Yeah. I mean, I can definitely understand how that would be hard. Yes. And I don't know if I shared that with with you or not. I Um, think you did. I don't remember. Yeah. I'm not quite sure. Yeah. And then I had to let go of how you were choosing to live your life or your journey. Yeah. Many many times I wished I could change the hands you were dealt. (laughs) Many times. Well, yeah. I mean, who doesn't? (laughs) Right. I know. But, yeah, giving you the space to make your choices for yourself and to to learn for yourself has, has been, it's been a gift for me, just like I think it's been the best way that I could mother you as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So if someone were going through that kind of hardship them, themselves, what would you tell them? Like it's not their loved one, but but it's themselves. What what would you want them to know? That um to recover you have to want it. You you can't just do it because other people want it for you. Like, I started at my eating disorder facility. I started there for my parents. Like, I 
I started, I started trying to get better because I saw how much I was hurting, hurting my parents. And for some people, most people don't really care. Some people feel like no one really cares about them, but I started there. And then while I was there, then I was like, okay, maybe I do actually want to do better. Maybe I do. And I sound like a depression medicine commercial right now, but like, (laughs) yeah, you have to want it. Hmm. Yeah. Well, this is, this is not always the easiest planet to live on. So I I think some days it's a mixed bag, you know, some days it's really great, but other days it's, it's not so much of a picnic. Um, So that, razor's edge of finding the place where you really do want to say yes I want to be alive for sure for sure yes so is there anything that you know is true now that you you didn't believe a year ago I mean that I'm not a garbage person I guess Mm. yeah and that not everyone in the world hates me also can you say can you say that again there was some your your microphone hit something that not everyone in the world hates me yeah yeah that you're likable and lovable. I mean I I don't like to say that but <laughs> you're still working on that one yeah but that I'm not hated. Yeah. And for a while you you thought that's what the truth was. Mhm. Yes. Oh, actually there is a question that I often ask um my guests and so I'll throw it out there and you can answer it if you want but you don't have to. So I like to ask them, so from your your perspective today, who you are today in your life and the wisdom you've gathered through through all these years, if you could go back to a younger version of yourself, any age, it could be a week ago or two years ago or six years ago, whatever, um, and just tell her, something just give her some wisdom what what would you say do you have any idea um don't worry about things too much don't don't stress over things Mm. because every everything happens for a reason yeah Mm. So maybe just take it a little more lightly. Mm-hmm. Good. So I, I do also want to say that I have tremendous love, of course, but admiration for you. And I know I've said this to you before, but you have been so instrumental in my growth and transformation and change and becoming the woman that I am today and it's not always because it's been a picnic although we've had many great days and moments but I just uh, am so grateful I get to be your mom and so proud that you are who you are and that you've taken on this journey for yourself Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. And I love you. (laughs) Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you again for going on this journey with Lila and I. As I said at the beginning, it felt really important to share the truth of this. First, to acknowledge that really challenging and painful things are happening in our lives, that we are being broken open 
by our relationships and by experiences and that there is no shame in that. And to be honest with you, it is my daughter's courage and willingness to be open and to recognize there is no shame in that that has freed me of, of deep hidden layers of shame for being vulnerable, emotional and messy and not always being some perfect picture of put together. And again, she provides a powerful reminder of the gift of adversity is becoming the compassionate, wise, and loving souls that we are today. And there's so much honor and dignity and value in that, which is contrary to everything that the culture would tell us and that I learned growing up. So thank you, my dear, for joining me in this very tender place in my human journey, sending you much love and the reminder to always trust what your heart knows. Thanks for listening to Trust Your Sacred Feminine Flow with Joni Advent Maher. If you like what you heard, the best compliment you can give us is to share our podcast with a friend and subscribe, rate, and review our podcast at iTunes.